Good afternoon. My name is Jean Anderson. I'm the Director of Education and Program Development for CASA Child, Adolescent and Family Mental Health. And I'm also a, a, a lead a person on developing the content for the video learning sessions. Um, welcome and thank you for coming to this afternoon's session with Neil Weiberg um, on FASD and practice issues for the prosecution or for prosecutors actually. We're pleased to say that there are approximately 100 sites connect, uh, or 55 sites connected with over 100 people participating. Education and training is a critical strategy in the FASD 10-year strategic plan that the government of Alberta has continued to address through various initiatives such as video conferencing, uh, such as the video conferencing learning series and we're pleased with the ongoing interest in attendance at these sessions. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Neil Weiberg. Neil Weiberg QC was called to the Alberta Bar in 1984. He's been a Crown Prosecutor or Chief Crown, Crown Prosecutor ever since. Neil has instructed at the Alberta Bar Admission course in a criminal law and trial advocacy. He was chair of the Law Society of Alberta's Criminal Practice Advisory Committee and currently is a member of the Law Society's Professional Responsibilities Committee. He's been a member of the Lakeland FASD Adult Diagnost Diagnostic Team and is currently a member of the Canadian FASD Diagnostic and Training Centre and Neil also um, uh, represents uh, the Alberta Justice on the uh, Alberta Cross Ministry FASD Committee. Uh, Neil was appointed to the Queen's Council in 2006, so it's my immense pleasure to welcome Neil to this afternoon's session. Thanks, Jean. <clears throat> It's a little disconcerting being in front of an audience like this. Of course, I'm always used to being in the courtroom and uh, usually there's a judge or a jury that lets me know how I'm doing. So this is a completely different format. For those of you in Lethbridge or Wainwright or wherever you are, uh, I hope I'm doing a good job. I'll be coming at this talk uh, from three different points of view and trying to combine those points of view from my experience. The first is as a trial lawyer uh, in the court for years. Second is as a member of the adult diagnostic team, first of the Lakeland FASD Centre and now of the Canadian Centre uh, along with Dr. Don Massey, Val Massey and Dr. Botha. And finally I appear often as counsel in front of the Alberta Board of Review uh, for the Attorney General and the Alberta Board of Review is the body that looks specifically at people that have been found not criminally responsible or unfit to stand trial and uh, I advocate the position of the Attorney General in front of that body. So I'll be trying to combine those three experiences uh, in doing this FASD issues involving prosecution. When I go to conferences, one of the questions I'm asked the most, I think, uh, by people that have children with FASD or uh, people involved in the FASD uh, world is, Neil, how can someone with FASD be in front of a criminal court? Can someone that has uh, lo uh, poor impulse control be in front of a criminal court? Can someone that doesn't understand the consequences of their actions be in front of criminal court? Can someone with poor executive functioning be in front of the criminal court? Can someone with permanent organic brain damage be in front of a criminal court? And these are many of the issues I want to talk about today in terms of the mental elements uh, of crime and uh, compare that with people with FASD. I'll start just with a, a quick story that appeared in uh, the Lethbridge Herald and this just sort of is a, a lesson to defense counsel not to use FASD as a quick label and hope you get credit for it. Uh, this is a case where a young man pled guilty to a manslaughter offense with his first lawyer and he <coughs> changed lawyers. Now I won't give the lawyer's name, I'll just say he was from another province, he's not an Alberta lawyer, and came into Lethbridge to handle this case. So the story begins like this, it's fairly short. The lawyer for a man who earlier pleaded guilty to manslaughter has until next month to show his client may not have been criminally responsible when he killed a Lethbridge man nearly two years ago. The lawyer said in Lethbridge Court at Queen's Bench his client, now 19, 
as fetal alcohol syndrome, a fact that wasn't emphasized enough by the first defense lawyer when the accused pleaded guilty. Had more evidence been admitted during earlier court hearings, it may have shown the accused was not criminally responsible for the stabbing death. The lawyer also suggested there may be some question whether the accused uh, actually killed the fellow. A court heard the victim was stabbed repeatedly after he approached the two boys to buy marijuana. The victim stumbled to a nearby pub for help but collapsed and died in the doorway. Although the teen pleaded guilty to manslaughter and has been awaiting sentencing, the new lawyer ex asked the judge to withdraw the plea. Uh, the Court of Queen's Bench Justice wouldn't accept the request without more evidence and the matter went over for two weeks. Uh, needless to say, in two weeks, uh, the new lawyer came back. There was no further evidence about FASD and the sentencing took place. In my view, this isn't a good example of advocacy because first of all, uh, the credit an accused would get for a guilty plea uh, is, is largely eradicated when there's questions whether he admits the facts or not. And second, by suggesting someone suffers from FASD, then providing no proof, no diagnosis, no further evidence, it looks a lot like the defense is just trying to make up an excuse. And again, that would not be uh, dealt with uh, favorably by the presiding court. So again, it's important that we deal with facts in these situations, not just throw out labels and hope that there'll be a light sentence granted at the end of the day. The first issue I'll talk about is a concept called fitness to stand trial. And again, I'm asked the, question, asked the question a lot, is someone with FASD fit to stand trial? The test for fitness to stand trial is a very, very low threshold. In my, in my whole career, in thousands and thousands of cases, only three times has someone been found unfit to stand trial. Once was in the middle of a trial, and twice it occurred uh, during a fitness hearing before a psychiatrist. I estimate in my career I've had several hundred individuals sent to Alberta Hospital for a fitness hearing to determine if they're fit to stand trial. And out of those several hundred, only three have come back as unfit to stand trial. So it's not a very high threshold for the Crown to meet to have someone declared fit to stand trial. The basic test is this. The test is, does the accused understand the surroundings he's in and understand really all the players who are there? He will be asked, for instance, do you know what the judge does? And if he says the judge is there to make a decision, that's right. That's very good evidence for fitness. He'll be asked, do you know what your lawyer does? And if he can provide the answer, my lawyer helps me with legal issues, that's the right answer. Again, they're not you will also be asked, where are you now? I'm in a courtroom. Those type of questions. That's the test for fitness to stand trial. And as you can understand, that's not a very high threshold to meet. There's nothing about executive functioning. There's nothing about uh, impulse control. None of those things matter. Does the person know where he is and does he understand, the does he understand who the players are? Does he understand the police officers there for court security? Does he understand the witness is there to give evidence what happened? That's a very low threshold. In my career, only three accused uh, were found unfit to stand trial. One was in the middle of a trial, and just to show how disturbed the individual was, uh, he was charged <coughs> with choking his sister. And in the middle of the trial, his defense lawyer was trying to suggest that it was self-defense, that his sister had provoked him uh, in order to, in order before the accused perpetrated his violence. So the defense lawyer asked, what did your sister do to you first? Pretty straightforward question. And the accused answered, do you realize there's only 15 doctors in the province of Alberta that own boats? That was his answer. You can tell by that answer to the question that he had really no idea where he was and no idea what process was taking place. After a couple of more questions like that, uh, the provincial court judge uh, took it upon himself, which he's able to do, to order a trial on the issue of whether the accused was fit to stand trial. And you could tell by that question and answer, it doesn't seem that he's aware of his surroundings or doesn't seem aware. Uh, psychiatric evidence was presented to the court and it was determined in this case that the accused 
was unfit to stand trial. Uh, it, this was prior to the recent criminal code amendments. So in the old days, we, we would say unfit to stand trial by reason of insanity. We don't use the word insanity anymore, but that's a good test for fitness to stand trial. In other words, is the person insane? And in this case, the ruling was that the accused was insane. He was unfit to stand trial, and he was remanded on a lieutenant governor's warrant to an institute for the criminally insane. Uh, after about six months, the psychiatrist drew of the view that he was now fit to stand trial. But that took six months of drugs and six months of therapy in a mental hospital. Two other individuals in my, in my experience were found unfit to stand trial. One was a stalker. He was convinced that a female had a relationship, interest in him, which of course none existed. This female was married and actually married to an RCMP <coughs> officer. And this accused persisted in going to the home knowing it was an RCMP officer. He was released on conditions to have no contact with this complainant, direct or indirect. And again, he'd go to the home knowing she was married to an RCMP officer. Now, anyone with their wits about them would know that if you're under a court order and you violate that court order and, in fact, go to the home of an RCMP officer, he just knocked on the door and was trying to deliver flowers or something like that. You would know that you're going to be arrested very quickly. In fact, when he was in custody, he continued to send letters to the RCMP detachment indicating that the woman was in love with him and that he was being denied access to her. Again, very close to what would, one would term insane and he was found unfit to stand trial. The third was a neighbor that had shot up uh, his neighbor's house. He, uh, I think, had hallucinations and went to a neighbor's house and uh, fired shots with a shotgun at the neighbor's house in the Kitscotty area. In that, in that particular case, and in the case of the stalker, both of those people were remanded to Alberta Hospital uh, because they were unfit to stand trial. And after a period of some months, they were deemed fit to stand trial uh, because of the drugs they took, because it stabilized them. They realized where they were and what they were doing, and they both proceeded to trial. The important thing about fitness to stand trial is it refers to today. It doesn't refer to the day the offense was committed. It refers to today. So if someone commits an offense and then years later or before the trial begins have a head injury or become mentally ill, and are unfit to stand trial, there's no test whatsoever what we're dealing with on the offense date. Fitness to stand trial only relates to today when the accused is being examined by psychiatrists or when the accused is, uh, is before the court. The expert opinion provided to the court is by psychologists or psychiatrists and again the test is a very low threshold. When I was on the Lakeland FASD adult diagnostic team, or currently uh, working with Dr. Massey, Dr. Massey in the um, Canadian Centre, um, part of our clinic involves the team being divided in half, and half the team dealing with the caregiver, and the other half of the team dealing with the patient in clinic. So I've had quite a bit of experience in clinical situations in being able to speak to an accused not an accused, being able to speak to a patient or being able to speak to the caregiver. And on every clinic I've been on, I can certify or I can say that the person that's been in clinic would always have been fit to stand trial. I don't specifically ask those questions, of course, but I can tell someone that, that, that I've had in clinic, if they were in a courtroom, they would know what the defense lawyer's role would be they would know what the judge's role would be. They understand the surroundings around them. So again, in my experience, uh, in the courtroom and contrasting that with the experience in a clinical setting, every one of the people that was diagnosed with FASD or ARND specifically, those ones would be fit to stand trial. Next, I'll deal quickly with not criminally responsible and not criminally responsible deals with the mind of the accused at the time of the offense. Doesn't worry what their mind is like today. It matters what their mind is like at the time of the offense. So in the examples I gave of someone that was found unfit to stand trial, 
They were found today in court. They were not fit to stand trial. After they were in Alberta Hospital for a number of months, received drugs, received some type of therapy, they came back to court. They were now fit to stand trial. So that issue is being dealt with. They're fit in front of the court. The issue now is, were they criminally responsible? That means you go back to the date of the offense and there's a specific test for criminal responsibility and you apply that test on the offense date to determine if they were criminally responsible. The test for criminal responsibility is referred to as McNaughton's Rules and it's approximately two centuries old and it was an old test again for insanity. Now the legal system always is far behind the, the social sciences or the pure and applied sciences. One thinks that the legal system is behind the times, and you're exactly right. And that's because people want certainty in the law. If they make a house deal and, uh, and uh, put, a, put a deposit down for a house, or if they want to sell a business, they want certainty that the transaction will go ahead. They don't want the court to come up with new laws or to come up with new rules and uh, be surprised by that. So the law tends to act on precedent and is very slow in developing new science that might come in. For example, DNA science was, was active in the pure sciences for years before it became part of the legal system. And even though we had uh, DNA science available, it was years before it was first introduced in court in a criminal case, and years before Parliament amended the criminal code to allow for the collection of DNA for DNA warrants and the DNA data bank. So criminal law always lags far behind uh, society in terms of your social sciences, your natural, pure and applied sciences. So it's not surprising we're using a test for insanity that's probably over a hundred years old. The test for insanity has two parts to it. First of all, does the accused understand the nature and quality of his act? And again, that's very simple. If someone moves his fist and hits somebody, is he aware that that's what he's doing with his body? The second part is, is he understanding what he does is morally wrong? Now, ignorance of the law is no excuse. I'm not saying that the accused has to realize this violates Section 266 of the Criminal Code. It's the issue, does he know what he's doing is wrong? In my career, I've never had anyone found not criminally responsible during the course of a trial. I've cross-examined psychiatrists and the accused have been found guilty of the offense. It's very rare to have someone found not criminally responsible. It's an easier threshold than unfit to stand trial but still it's very, very difficult. And again, going back to my clinical setting, the people that I observed at the Lakeland Center or the people I observed at the Canadian Center, all of those people, if they had committed a criminal offense, they would have been criminally responsible for their act. I've appeared quite often at the Alberta Board of Review and seen a lot of people that have been found in Alberta not criminally responsible. I'll talk briefly about the Alberta Border Review. The Alberta Border Review is chaired by either a lawyer or a judge. There are currently two judges, Judge Stevens Gill and Assistant Chief Judge Paul, that act as rotating chairs of the Alberta Board of Review. Two of the members at one time have to be psychiatrists and there can be a maximum of two from the community at large that are appointed by the Lieutenant Governor and Council. The normal quorum or the normal number on the Alberta Border Review is five. The chair is a judge or a lawyer that I indicated. They only vote to break a tie. So the normal vote is among the other members, the psychiatrists and the members at large. Everyone that's been found unfit to stand trial or not criminally responsible has to have their case reviewed once a year, at least once a year. In other words, they can't just be placed in the mental hospital and, and be kept there forever without a hearing. So there's a hearing for all these individuals. 
that have been found unfit to stand trial or not criminally responsible at least once a year. Speaking of the not criminally responsible, the vast majority of the not criminally responsible that I've seen at Alberta Hospital before the Border Review are paranoid schizophrenics. These are people that hear voices, often there's a religious connotation, and they feel that they must kill the person or hurt the person uh, because of the voices and because of the commandments. They aren't in control of their faculties and they think they're doing the right thing. And these are very tragic cases. Often it's family members that are killed uh, or family members that are injured. But a common factor in a lot of the cases is that the individuals hear voices and they think they're doing the right thing because they're commanded by the voices. Some people might try and fake that afterwards, uh, but the psychiatrists, of course, are well trained and are uh, looking for people that might be trying to fake that. So again, in my experience, someone with FASD doesn't fit into this area, and those people, if they were charged with a criminal offense, would not be found not criminally responsible because they don't fit under McNaughton's rules of insanity, and that's the test for not criminally responsible. Not criminally responsible defense can lead that evidence at a trial, and it's up to the judge or the jury at the end of the day to determine if the person is guilty of the offense or not guilty, but, and, and therefore not criminally responsible. If someone is found not criminally responsible for a crime, what happens to them? Are they just let go? No, they're not. What normally happens is when someone is found not criminally responsible for a crime, they are remanded to Alberta Hospital, usually in custody, and at that point they're guaranteed a hearing, usually within 90 days of their admission. The Alberta Board of Review has three options that they can decide. They can hold someone with what's called a full warrant, the second option is a conditional discharge, and the third option is an absolute discharge. Now for the lawyers out there, don't get mixed up between the conditional discharges and absolute discharges that are part of the sentencing regime that are discussed in the McFarland case. This isn't, uh, this isn't that type of conditional discharge, which is a sentence. The phrase is the same, but there are conditional discharges and absolute discharges that are granted by the Alberta Board of Review. The person is actually found not guilty, but their liberty is restricted and is under the control of the Alberta Board of Review. So not guilty if they're found not criminally responsible. The Alberta Board of Review will receive submissions or receive a package from what's called the treatment team. And that will be the treating psychiatrist, uh, perhaps some other psychiatrists, and other professionals that form part of the team at Alberta Hospital. There are employment counselors, there's recreation workers, there's occupational therapists, there's all sorts of people like that that form part of a treatment team. And they prepare a report for the Alberta Board of Review every time someone that's been found unfit to stand trial, or more commonly, not criminally responsible, comes before that board. There will be, of course, a synopsis of the crime, and that's referred to as the index offense. There is usually a transcript of what was stated in court, and then there's full psychiatric reports over the past year. And unlike court, where documents are, are given by one side, the Crown or defense, to the judge, this panel have all the reports in advance. So they've read the report of the treatment team, they know the underlying history, and they know the current psychiatric conditions that the accused is suffering from or that the accused uh, has gone within the last year. There's reports how they've done, if they've breached their privileges, if they've taken their medication, if they've been compliant. There's full reports like that. The board members get to ask questions of the treatment team physicians, psychiatrists, and also of the accused. The accused is usually represented by a lawyer, and the Alberta Justice is represented by one of its Crown prosecutors. And we get to ask questions of the treatment team as well. 
Following the hearing, the treatment team gets uh, the treatment team has made a recommendation, and but the lawyers get to make submissions whether they agree with that or not. Again, the the conditions can be remain on a full warrant, receive a conditional discharge, which means that there's more privileges attached, or an absolute discharge, and that means the Alberta Board of Review has no further in uh, no further dealings with the accused, and the accused is at liberty and won't be involved with the Alberta Board of Review again. Even if he commits other crimes, he's free of the Alberta Board of Review. Absolute discharges are rare. They are not granted easily by the Alberta Board of Review. It's usually a full warrant or a conditional discharge. A conditional discharge has terms similar to the full warrant, and they can include, and, and often, even on a conditional discharge, the accused is remanded at Alberta Hospital. Sometimes they're free to live in the community, but there are strict conditions and strict monitoring on the accused uh, while he's in the community. Absolute discharges are rare. I have seen numerous cases before the Alberta Board of Review where people have been there for well over 20 years. So they have been found not guilty by reason of uh, they're not criminally responsible, but 20 years later they are still housed in Alberta Hospital and still not at full liberty. Some live in the community but are under strict conditions. As well, I have seen numerous individuals that were charged with offenses other than murder, sometimes assault who have been under control of the Alberta Review Board 10, 15 years later. So it's not something to take lightly to argue that you're not criminally responsible because it's not a free ride. Uh, you will be monitored closely by the Alberta Review Board and their main concern is risk to the public. And if they feel there's a risk to the public, uh, that's paramount in their view. And if there is a risk of the public, uh, public safety is paramount and that su sufficient controls and conditions have to be placed on an accused. So often an accused isn't free to travel. There's strict restrictions on how they can travel, strict conditions on where they can live, things like that. So if you're a defense lawyer and have someone suffering from FASD, would it be in your best interest to argue that this person is unfit to stand trial when they may spend years and years and years in a mental institution or years and years and years with strict conditions placed upon them. Uh, even if they were found guilty in criminal court for a minor offense, they might be looking at a fine or a short probation term. So these are concepts not to be uh, dealt with um, loosely by defense and defense bar by and large uh, respect that and realize that short of a murder situation, uh, it's very it's very dangerous to raise uh, not criminally responsible because in fact they could be spending a lot more time uh, with their liberty affected by going that route. Anyone that's been found not criminally responsible is has at least once a year um, has at least once a year their their terms looked at and have a report in front of that board of review. But as I said, absolute discharges are rare, and there's, I would say, an average often of well over 10 years of involvement of Alberta Board of Review once someone comes in front of them having been found not criminally responsible. So that article I read earlier where the lawyer came from another province and sort of just off the cuff said, hey, my client should be found not criminally responsible, that's not something that should be taken lightly. Next I'll deal with mens rea, def mens rea defenses and you're probably asking yourself well is there any um, issues with people with FASD? It doesn't seem that they're unfit to stand trial. It seems that they're criminally responsible for their actions. Is there anywhere in the criminal law that someone that's FASD could be given special consideration or there could be uh, certain things done for them as opposed to someone that has not been diagnosed with FASD. And I submit there are, there are certain defenses uh, that are available in criminal law 
that applies specifically to someone with FASD. I'll give you a story I had once. I was at uh, a clinic and I was in the group that was interviewing, um, interviewing the patient undergoing the diagnosis. And this was a young man, he was an adult, he was in his early 20s. And he said to the group, there were, uh, to the group of us at the clinic, he said, boy, I'm sure glad I got a lot of storage space in my house. Really has help, helped out a lot with my friends. And one of the, um, the doctors said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I'll tell you what, he said, my friends come to me almost every week now with, with new stuff and they need me to store it. You know, often they have TVs or they have uh, VCRs or they have, um, they have uh, computers, things like that, and they need to store it for a short period of time. And after uh, a few days, they need it back and they don't have the room in their house to do it, so they ask if I can do it. But I got lots of storage space, so I'm glad to do it. I know it sounds a little bit facetious, but, but even as a cynical prosecutor, I knew this individual was being truthful. And uh, that, was, that was in his own mind. He had these new friends, and these friends were using him to store stolen property. Now, what if the police happened to get information that this fellow had stolen property in his house and uh, went and executed a search warrant and found stolen property? Now, the definition of stolen property is, first of all, the accused has to be in possession of stolen property, but not just that, he has to know or ought to know that the property is stolen. And so if you think about it, if you go to a car dealership and buy a car and the title looks good and you find out it's stolen afterwards, you shouldn't be found guilty of possession of stolen property because you had no idea it was stolen. You bought it and you thought it a reputable dealership. It's not that you bought it at the bar with, uh, you know, with someone that, uh, that wrote out a, uh, um, a bill of sale on the back of a matchbook cover. You bought it at a reputable dealer. You, you should, you believe, that, the, and you paid what looked like a fair price for this. You, there's no idea you would know that was stolen property. So the, the crime of possession of stolen property requires a mental element, not just that you possess the stolen property, but a mental element that you knew or ought to have known this was stolen property. Now what about someone with FASD? And in fact, this young man that I just told you about. For the first part of the crime, yes, he was in possession of stolen property. But did he know it was stolen? No, he didn't know it was stolen. And ought he have known that it was stolen? I think if there was evidence before the court that this fellow had an FASD diagnosis, that would make a real big difference. If it was someone with no, um, no such diagnosis and no apparent mental problems, how I just described it sounds pretty suspicious. And in law we use a phrase willful blindness to indicate that the person does that. An example of willful blindness would be another case I had. This was someone that didn't have FASD that was charged with possession of a stolen car. He said, well I bought it from someone uh, behind the bar for $500. It seemed a little bit cheap but um, you know for a new car $500. Uh, but um, I, I still I wasn't suspicious. And then I asked, did the, did the seller of the car give you keys? He said, no, he gave me a screwdriver to start it. Now, in this case, even though the accused says I didn't know it was stolen, anybody hearing those facts should be suspicious. And they say, well, no one told me it was stolen. In this case, we'd refer to this as willful blindness, that that person ought to have known it was stolen. But in the example I gave, if there was a diagnosis of FASD, I think a judge in that case would say someone with FASD who had friends coming to him and having him just store the property and not partake in any of the proceeds, this is someone that didn't, legitimately didn't know this was stolen property. So in that case, I would argue the person that has an FASD diagnosis would be treated differently by the criminal court. And in that case, the criminal court would properly find that the accused in that instance is not guilty because he didn't have the sufficient mental element to be guilty of the crime. Someone with similar facts without FASD, I would submit it was obvious when friends were keeping bring new stereos over or new TVs over, new computers uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, they, they would be uh, willfully blind by not recognizing that they were in possession of stolen property at the time. 
So I think there's a lot of areas in terms of mental elements of crime where someone with FASD uh, can, take, can take advantage of certain defenses. And that's what I refer to as mens rea defenses. Sentencing. This is another area where there can be a, a wide uh, range of, of sentences available. And this is where someone with an FASD diagnosis, um, I think, can get a different sentence. First of all, generally, people with FASD have low impulse control. They often don't understand the consequences of their actions. They don't plan things out. And, uh, and it's not specifically related to IQ. When I was at the Lakeland Center, we had two people that were diagnosed with ARND, um, uh, one of the sets of FASD. And those two individuals had IQs in excess of 130. Now, both of these individuals were totally incapable of competitive employment and totally incapable of independent living, despite the IQ of 130. And that's because the main thing affected by the FASD, one of the main things in the brain damage, is executive functioning. And executive functioning is different than IQ. And executive functioning has been defined as the ability to lead life. Uh, people that have poor executive functioning um, often, I say, get fired from jobs because they show up late. They often are involved in crimes because they don't understand. Uh, they often commit stupid crimes, again, because they don't understand. Or they're often used as dupes because they're taken advantage of by other people. And again, if a sentencing court knows of this, it's appropriate for the sentencing court to take that into account in determining a sentence. And often, in a break and enter offense, uh, the people that keep the money take advantage of someone, and that person might be keeping watch. In fact, sometimes that person is sent in to get the property and turn it over. And I would argue that where someone's being taken advantage of, where they know what they're doing is wrong, but they're coaxed into it, because they want to make friends uh, with, with other people, that they should receive a lesser sentence than the people that have uh, their full faculties about them and uh, are, are much more willful in what they do. Similarly, we see the issue of breaches with um, people with FASD. Often someone commits their first crime and get placed on probation. And the probation order has a lot of complex terms in it. It might have terms like see your probation officer forthwith and at least every two weeks thereafter. Take anger management counseling as directed by your probation officer. Take addictions counseling as directed by your probation officer. Perform 20 hours of community service work. And pay restitution by a certain date. That's a typical probation order. But how many people with FASD, if they don't have a life coach or an external brain, how many of those people are capable on their own of fulfilling all their terms? I would argue almost none. If they're fortunate enough to have a caregiver that keeps a list of their obligations and drives them to their appointments, or at the very least reminds them in the morning they have to go somewhere, there's a chance they might comply, comply with the order. But otherwise, there is very little chance that someone with uh, FASD would comply with the order. And what happens when they don't comply with the order? They're breached. They're charged with breach of probation. And what does the judge think when someone comes in front of them on a breach of probation? The natural thought is the judge says, I gave you a break last time, and now you've shown co complete contempt for my order. So the judges usually deal with the breach fairly strictly because they see it as contempt of the order. If no one's told the judge this accused as FASD, the judge just sees it as someone that was placed on probation and thumbed his nose at the court by not complying with any of the conditions. And when we see sometimes someone with an FASD diagnosis, we'll see one early criminal conviction, perhaps a shoplifting, and then you will see 
breach after breach after breach because the judge will send them to jail often for the first breach and say, but you're not getting off that lightly. You still have to comply with those original terms. So you're going back on probation and you have to complete all these terms. Again, the person's in the same quandary as before. No one's taking to him his appointments. He forgets his appointments. He breaches again. And guess what? The judge takes it even more seriously this time that the judge feels, now this guy's showing out and out contempt for my order, and the sentence will be more strict. If there isn't information before the court that he's FASD, it often gets into one of those revolving doors where an accused uh, will continually breach that particular order. At clinic once, I was um, speaking to a, a young fellow, and uh, he was um, diagnosed again with ARND. And one of the things that came up was that he had recently been convicted for impaired driving. And one of the questions I asked the caregiver was, where do you keep the car keys? He said, oh, we keep them in a bowl right by the front door. I said, you might want to reconsider that because this fellow with a FASD, of course, has poor impulse control and, of course, often with FASD, don't understand the consequences of their actions or don't think of the consequences of their actions until it's too late. And I told them in rural Alberta where this was, in the Coal Lake area, that most of the provincial court judges in the Edmonton Rural District uh, imposed a jail term if you were found driving while disqualified. Because again, you were ordered by the court not to drive for a particular period of time and you violated that court order. So that's seen as contempt of a court order and the person went to jail. And the caregiver said, geez, that's a good point. They never thought of it. And they didn't realize the serious consequences that would have uh, befallen um, their child if, in fact, he had been caught driving while disqualified. So those, are again, are, are things to, to bear in mind. Now, by no means am I suggesting that people with FASD are more prone to criminal behavior. Um, at the Lakeland Center, we found that approximately 80 to 90 percent of people that were diagnosed with uh, FASD had criminal justice issues. Not all of them were accused, however. Some of them were victims, that they were victims of domestic assault, that they were young women that got themselves in abusive relationships and couldn't get out of those relationships and were witnesses, um, again, didn't want to testify, but were witnesses in domestic assault cases. We had people from, with warrants from other provinces. And we had people that themselves were accused had been con convicted of, of various crimes. Uh, but by no means am I suggesting that someone with FASD is prone to criminal behavior. But someone with FASD, um, the psychiatrists and psychologists advise me, um, have low impulse control. They don't understand the consequences of their actions and have poor executive functioning. And unfortunately, uh, especially in young adults, uh, people with those kind of qualities can get themselves into trouble. And also people with that aid, uh, with, with FASD, are often very anxious to make friends, very anxious to keep friends who are sometimes poor choices. And I found lots of circumstances where people with FASD are taken advantage of by friends and are drawn into criminal activity. And because they, are, they lack friends and uh, are so happy to get friends, for them the friendship's more important than, uh, than the criminal activity. The court system is not a good place to find, uh, is, not, is not a good place to discover FASD. The criminal justice system involves lots of people and lots of people going through the system uh, very quickly at one time. If you've ever been to docket court in this province, most places in the province, and not just the larger centers, but I've done docket court in Fort McMurray and St. Paul and Coal Lake and Bonneville, there's lots and lots of cases on a first appearance docket. There sometimes are 50 or 60 cases on a first appearance. So if you think, how long does the accused have to talk to the judge? 
or uh, when the judge asks them a question, when you've got 60 other people on the docket, or how long does the accused have a chance to speak to duty counsel if he's using duty counsel in that session? Uh, there's not much time. And one of the difficulties is most people with FASD have very good expressive language. And if you speak to them uh, for a short period of time, they do very, very well. I have a, a chart that was developed by Diane Malbin, and she just looks at various uh, age equivalents for various skills for someone with FASD that's 18 years old. So for an 18-year-old, uh, their expressive language is equivalent to a 20-year-old. So they have better expressive language than the average population. Their comprehension is that of a six-year-old. Their money and time concepts are that of an eight-year-old. Emotional maturity, six-year-old. Physical maturity, of course, it's 18 because that's their chronological age. Reading ability, 16. Social skills, seven. Living skills, 11. So again, Diane Malbin from Oregon was the one that prepared those statistics. But if one looks at that, expressive language of a 20-year-old and comprehension of a six-year-old, imagine how that person's going to do in the justice system. When he has one or two minutes to speak to the judge, he's going to say all the right things. He has the expressive language of a 20-year-old, and he'll sound very, very good. But his comprehension is very low. So unfortunately, someone with this profile really develops high expectations, or he, uh, people develop high expectations because of that expressive language. So when the judge says, is there anything you want to say for yourself, he'll say all the right things, and that person will sound far more literate than the majority of the accused that go through the criminal justice system. So the judge will say, boy, this guy really says something. He can really deliver. So very high expectations would be created by that kind of profile. And as I said, duty counsel gets very brief time in dealing with, with the accused. The judge doesn't have a lot of time. Um, if there's a pre-sentence report ordered, uh, we'll, they'll learn a lot more. But there's very little time. And if one looks at the expressive language that I discussed, high expectations are created. And again, in sentencing, when the accused doesn't fulfill those, those expectations, often they receive a severe sentence at the end of the day. That means it's important for defense counsel or for the caregiver to bring it to the court's attention that FASD is a factor here. Because if it's not brought to the court's attention, it's very unlikely that the judge, the prosecutor, will be aware of this or duty counsel based on a very short dealing with, um, with an accused person. So that's why it's important for a caregiver to mention it to their lawyer about the FASD if in fact that's, that's a, uh, an issue or if that's a suspicion. Most judges in my experience are very pleased to deal with, with, um, with FASD, to learn about it, and to uh, impose an appropriate sentence taking into account that FASD is a factor. I know in the province of Alberta there's been two seminars that were organized by the Youth Defense Office and had tremendous attendance from um, Alberta judges, Alberta Provincial Court judges. And in my experience, if it's brought to their attention, the majority of the Alberta judges uh, will certainly take that into account and uh, wisely uh, impose that in any uh, sentence deliberations that they might have taking place. Another question is the difference between adult and youth court. Does, does the fact that someone have FASD, could that make a difference? And yes, that can make a difference too. And there was a case in Lethbridge, um, initials IB, where uh, uh, someone under the age of, of 18 committed a murder of a group home worker. And this was back when the Un Young Offenders Act was in place. But I suggest the Youth Criminal Justice Act that's in place now wouldn't have made a difference. The issue was someone with FASD um, 
and uh, that committed this murder, was the youth system sufficient to deal with someone with FASD? And under the youth system, if someone's dealt with murder in the youth system, the maximum sentence would be three years. Uh, it's a longer sentence if they're dealt with in the adult court. And the expert evidence given both by a psychiatrist and a psychologist in that case was that three years was not sufficient. Now, this person had other problems. He was a sexual predator, which of course has nothing to do with the FASD, but he was a sexual predator as well. But the fact he had FASD would make it more difficult for a timely and quick rehabilitation because of the lear learning difficulties, those things. And the court in that case determined that the youth system would not be the best place for, because they have to think of both the public and the accused, and the view was the youth system was not the best location for this individual, that the adult system would be better, because the number of years needed for the therapy to hurt, to possibly rehabilitate this, this youth would greatly exceed the three years. So in that particular case, uh, IB, it was determined that the appropriate sentence would be an adult sentence. And again, it was looked at very carefully, and the fact that there was FASD uh, made, a, made a great difference in that particular case, because they looked at the rehabilitative, rehabilitative points, and they felt it was not possible to rehabilitate this individual in th less than three years. More time was required, and so as an adult, the sentence would be a life sentence with uh, no possibility of parole for, for uh, eight years. Just a couple closing comments while waiting for questions to come in. Um, FASD is a, a relatively new science, and as I said, the law is, uh, is behind on this. It's incumbent on defense counsel to advise courts that their clients have FASD. In my experience, uh, in the courts, I've never once had a defense counsel or a caregiver come to me to say that their child or their client had FASD, and I'm convinced that in um, numerous cases that I've had that, in fact, people had FASD. A couple quick examples. Um, one day in Wainwright, I was doing um, a sentencing of a youth, and before you can get custody of a youth, you have to have what's called a pre-sentence report, or predisposition report. And in the predisposition report, the probation officer prepares it and finds out about a youth, youth's background, what he's doing, his schooling, his family situation, addictions, things like this. And this youth told the probation officer these things in the course of the predisposition report. The first thing that the youth told the probation officer was, I think youth court's a joke and told him that. Second thing he said was, if the judge gives me probation, I will not comply with any of the terms. Now he knew this report was being prepared to give to the judge to determine what his sentence was. So first, youth court is a joke. Second, if the judge gives me probation, which I want, I won't comply with any of the terms. And third, I'm a leader, I'm not a follower. So if you look at that, those aren't really good things to say in a predisposition report. Um, his lawyer was pretty shocked when he read those things and the lawyer said to him, it's not a question if you're going to go to jail now, the question is how long you're going to go to jail. But looking back on it, why would someone say those things to, uh, why would someone say those things to the probation officer who's writing up a report to the judge which determines whether he goes to jail or not. So in retrospect, if one looks at the bravado of those kind, it's obviously someone that didn't understand the consequences of their actions and sounded like someone with low impulse control just beaking off. Uh, I sometimes wonder uh, about the diagnosis of that person. Another time when I was in Fort McMurray, I had a case where uh, a girl was ordered to perform 50 hours of community service work. And she was able to perform that community service work at the local library, so it wasn't really unpleasant working conditions. And she came to the court, or to a probation officer, um, half a day before it was due, and was upset that the library couldn't give her 50 hours when she was on the last day of her 
the last day of her, of her allowed time. She had until end of May, for example, May 31st. She showed up on May 31st and was upset that the library couldn't satisfy her 50 hours on that one particular day. Now, if you think about it, obviously uh, there's only 24 hours in a day, so there's no possible way she could have expected the library could have given her 50 hours of work or on one particular day. And again, she went to court and the judge was not impressed that she waited until the very last day and was not impressed when she complained that it was the library's fault for not giving her 50 hours on the, on the very last day. But again, I wonder about an accused such as that, whether uh, that individual um, was suffering from FASD because again, it has all the hallmarks of behavior that really just makes no sense whatsoever. Those are my remarks. I'll await any questions that, uh, that you have. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Uh, Neil, I wonder if you have any examples of um, legal services that are being provided uh, to youth and adults that, that are designed to take into account these considerations. Okay, first of all, the question was, is there any legal services that are present that take into account these considerations? So, for instance, the Lakeland Center that I was involved in, we had three where defense counsel um, had legal aid pay a disbursement, so the, the, um, the clinic's fees were paid for by legal aid, and, a, and uh, first a diagnosis and secondly a treatment plan was delivered to the defense lawyer as part of that. Uh, as part of that disbursement. So defense lawyers can get that kind of assessment and then make what use of it they think is, is best. So the, the actual um, diagnosis makes a very significant difference to the outcome for the makes a very the Makes a very big difference and that was what I was referring to right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, some defense counsel just want to throw out a label because they don't want to say my client's just a bad person. They want a reason why the person committed the crime. And so without a diagnosis to say, I suspect my person has FASD, um, usually the court or the Crown will want proof of that because it's easy to say that. If they're saying, I want a lower sentence, uh, my client is FASD, there usually has to be some medical evidence. And uh, that's why I know at Lakeland we had disbursements through legal aid. But there are more and more clinics uh, around every day that provide uh, diagnosis around Alberta. And um, the clinic at high level, for instance, had a probation officer involved. So that was their legal component at high level, was to have a probation officer involved in their FASD diagnostic clinic in high level. Any other questions that have come in? Okay. They have your email. Yes. Well, thank everybody for their attention. Thanks very much, Neil. That was really informative. And uh, certainly for uh, a person with a no legal background, it was really interesting to understand the different terminology and the significance for people with FASD. So thank you again and we will uh, look forward to you participating again. Thank you, Neil. Thank you.